Thank you for this introduction and for the invitation to um, share with you an interesting topic on fertility, but also cancer during pregnancy. So here we will focus on the pediatric outcomes of maternal cancer diagnosis during uh, pregnancy. For those who are looking for randomized phase T trials, I have to disappoint you. They do not exist in this matter. I've got three take-home messages. Surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy are possible during pregnancy. If, if you have to choose between prematurity or chemotherapy, please go for uh, chemotherapy because we should not uh, uh, neglect the long-term consequences of prematurity. And an interdisciplinary approach is important in referral centers with a high-risk uh, obstetrical unit, especially when you give chemotherapy because of the association with small for gestational age babies. I will start with a case to show you the impact we can have on patients and their treatment. This is an um, image from a 28-year-old psychologist. She's a non-smoker, she's a non-drinker, and she had a tongue carcinoma. As you can see, um, the carcinoma is here, going from here till the other side of the tongue. So this is a T4, there were suspect nodes, and 2 M0 disease. She was referred to our colleagues from the obstetric unit for the termination of pregnancy, but we changed the policy, we discussed with the patient, we showed her the possibilities. Um, she was treated, she was uh, operated eight to nine hours uh, surgery. We talked, due to the positive notes, there was a need for radiotherapy, so we calculated basically the fetal exposure when we, when we should irradiate this field. So we discussed with a radiophysicist, this is a phantom, this is the head, the thorax, this should be the pregnancy, and this is the LED screen. And we calculated that the fetal exposure was below the limits of fetal um, damage. So here is our patient. Actually, she's irradiated during pregnancy with shielding, actually, the field from the radiation. Now, we're a bit further. This is the patient. This is Zoe. That's the uh, baby that was in the abdomen during the treatment. This is a success story because despite the node positive disease, the patient is doing well, and moreover, they, she conceived and delivered a second time. So this is what we can mean to our patients. The agenda will be on four uh, topics. I will share with you the most novel findings of our registry, very short on surgery during pregnancy. The main focus will be on the chemotherapy in the long-term disease pediatric outcomes, and I will end up with some clinical re recommendations. This was an abstract last week presented as a late-breaking abstract at the European Society of Gynecological Oncology on behalf of the International Network on Cancer, Infertility, and Pregnancy. Basically, what we did is we looked into the oncological management and pregnancy outcomes in women with a cancer diagnosis in pregnancy and mainly look to the 20-year follow-up, and this in 1,170 patients. So we use the INSIP online database, patients with a primary diagnosis of cancer during pregnancy, 20-year follow-up, 20-year uh, period, and we looked on oncological, obstetrical, and neonatal outcomes. We mainly looked to the preterm, pre-labor rupture of membranes and preterm contractions, small for gestational age babies, neonatal intensive care unit admissions, and the changes in oncological and obstetrical outcome over this period of 20 years. So 1,170 patients from 37 centers in 16 countries. We will not go into detail in the breakdown of the cancers, but mainly the main message is these are the cancers that we see in patients of reproductive age. Uh, we also have the stage distribution. So, in 1,142 pregnancies with a known outcome, there were 86% live births, 2% miscarriages, 10% terminations, and 2% stillbirths. There were 955 singleton pregnancies resulting live births, 52% term delivery, 48% preterm delivery. Uh, of these, 6% were spontaneous preterm delivery, and of the term deliveries, 4% were PPROM or with preterm uh, contractions. Regarding to the neonatal outcome, small for gestational age occurred in 21%, admission to neonatal intensive care 41%, and age 84% was prematurity related of these 4% congenital malformations. The risk factors for adverse outcomes were 
Uh, actually, largely inconclusive for P-PROM and P-TERM contractions. We did not expect this, basically. But we had in interesting findings for small for gestational age. This was related to the, pregnant, to the age, to the systemic disease. That means stage 4 disease in all patients with leukemia. And this was related to chemotherapy for a joint evaluation of the six agents. But the strongest risk factor was platinum-based chemotherapy. Risk factors for uh, NICO admission was the malignancy type with the highest chance in gastrointestinal cancer and the lowest for thyroid cancer, chemotherapy, and especially the taxanes. And what was a protective factor was actually surgery for um, ovarian disease or cervical uh, cancer. This and the next slide are actually from this abstract, the two most important slides. Here we see uh, the, the uh, percentage of the oncological treatment over the three uh, periods, so before 2005, between 2005 and 2009, and after 2010. And we saw a decrease of patients where there was no cancer treatment during pregnancy, no big difference for surgery, but we see, saw definitely an, an increased trend for chemotherapy, a reduced trend for radiotherapy, increased trend for targeted therapy. And regarding to the obstetrical outcome, there were less miscarriages, uh, less pre uh, pregnancy terminations, less stillbirths. There was an increase in overall live births, and very important, a decrease in premature live births. If we put the change figures in another other way, actually what we saw is every five calendar years, there were 10% more patients treated during pregnancy. Every five calendar years, there were 4% more live births. Every five years, there were 7% fewer preterm live births, 9% fewer iatrogenic preterm live births, and 9% fewer admissions at the neonatal intensive care unit. But this had a cost. Every five years, there were 16% more uh, small for gestational age babies, mainly related to, chemo to chemotherapy. So that's a very important message here. Regarding surgery, I only have uh, one slide because the previous speaker uh, already pointed into this very in detail. Our main message is indeed we have a vast experience on surgery in benign disease, and basically this is not different from cancer surgery. If you take care for the mother, then you take care for the baby. Um, so adequate ox oxygenation, left lateral tilt position. And the main question is then should we monitor or not? Our message is if you uh, draw any clinical conclusion from uh, fetal distress, then you have to monitor. For example, at the left, this is a patient at 20 weeks gestational age. Suppose the baby would be in distress, you would not do a caesarean section at 20, years, at 20 weeks of gestational age, so there's no need to monitor. At the right, this patient was 29 weeks. If that baby would be in a distress, you would do a caesarean section, so that's why we do there the monitoring. And as you can see, the fetal heart monitoring, that the baby is actually sleeping together with the mother because there is little, little variation uh, and variability. And you can also measure the uh, con uh, contractions. Regarding chemotherapy, actually, pregnancy is like very protected. If we have a pregnant woman, we tell them not to drink alcohol because alcohol drinking during pregnancy will decrease in the alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. That's why we advise them not to drink. For smoking, this results in small babies, increased uh, risk for intrauterine death. So that's why we advise our patients not to smoke during pregnancy. But then chemotherapy, this is a drug designed to kill rapidly dividing cells. So what do we tell this lady who suffered from breast cancer and gets chemotherapy during pregnancy? How did we convince her to accept chemotherapy that is designed to kill these cells? So we told this patient that if you give chemotherapy after the first trimester of pregnancy, that there is no increased risk of congenital malformations. This is our, the, actually the first study of our registry in 2010, and there we saw that there's actually um, no more and no other congenital malformations. In red, you see the malformations, um, the major malformations, and there you actually see that they are mainly prevalent in patients who do not receive cancer treatment, who only uh, receive surgery. So in the group with chemotherapy, for example, hip subluxation, you can discuss whether this is really congenital malformation, um, and some small uh, minor uh, malformations. So that's important to tell our patients. Then I want to share with you the data we have on the long-term outcome of children. Um, we, at the age of 1.5 years and three years, we do the Bailey scales of infant development. Later on, 
Um, the type of test depends a bit on the age of the child, but we look to intelligence, attention, verbal and nonverbal uh, memory, and to the behavior, which is a checklist. And you see that the different tests that are uh, used to test these children. The first publication here was in 2012 in Lancet Oncology, where we looked um, into the long-term cognitive and cardiac outcomes of these children. Very short, this is the main um, figure of this uh, publication. We saw an increase of the IQ score with 2.5 for each week increase in pregnancy duration. So that mainly the message from this figure is that if your patient, if your baby is, has a, is born term, there is actually a normal outcome um, and instead when the baby is pretermly delivered. When we looked in, into the children who were uh, older, um, the results were ex expressed as a Z-score, so everything which is be between minus one and plus one is actually normal. And then you can see that for behavior, memory, and attention for the different tests, actually that all the results are well within these normal limits. Of course, the numbers here are not so high, uh, 21, uh, 25, but the, strong, the strength of this study is that these children are already quite old, eight and nine years old, so that's a very a strong element of this study. Nevertheless, the study had its limitations. The group of children was heterogeneous. The youngest was 1.5 years, the oldest 18 years, and we had no control group. So we improved the um, study design and published two years ago in the New England the uh, update of this study. Basically, we had 129 children in the study group co compared to 129 group um, in the uh, control group. This is the breakdown of the different uh, uh, treatment uh, combinations or treatments that were given, but basically the main message is that in fact 100 children were exposed to chemotherapy and or radiotherapy of the 129, but also these children were exposed to the stress, the imaging studies and the supporting drugs, drugs that are associated with cancer treatment during pregnancy. So. Pediatricians look to the general health, uh, clinical examination, a questionnaire. One of our PhD students looked to the cognitive outcome, did the Bailey scales of infant development, and uh, we looked into the heart, echocardiography, and the electrocardiography. Uh, Actually, the characteristics of the children at the baseline were well um, balanced between the two groups. Important is to realize that 21% was born preterm. Important is the postnatal growth, left males, right females. We see, look into the length at the top, the weight, and the head circumference. Ovals is study group, triangle is a control group, and basically uh, the study children did not differ uh, from the control ch children regarding the biometry, which is important, because we already said that chemotherapy relates to small for gestational age. So the children are born smaller, but during their evolution, they catch up. That's actually the message from this figure. If we look into the general health, the incidence of medical problems, the need for surgery or medical uh, care, this was comparable between the two groups. Most important figure from this publication is this, where we looked into the cognitive outcome, and there was really no difference between the two uh, groups. But then, when we look into the different types of chemotherapy, for example, we see in the black line is always the uh, study group, and in the gray is the, are the controls. So for the whole group, but for chemotherapy or then anthracyclines, taxanes, platinum derivatives, radiotherapy, surgery, or no treatment, there were actually no differences uh, neither. Then we look to the number of chemocycles. And here we see uh, the cognitive outcome in the y-axis and the x-axis, the number of chemotherapy cycles. And in fact, if the, the child was exposed to one or two cycles of chemotherapy or six or seven, that did not impact the outcome. There are data on the cognitive outcome, although they are limited. And also here, there is no really um, relation between the estimated fetal dose and the cognitive outcome. This is the second most important figure of this uh, publication, because here you see again that figure from uh, the previous study, the same um, correlation between the cognitive outcome and prematurity. But here we have a control group. So that means prematurity worsens the outcome, but this effect is independent from chemotherapy. We also look to the cardiac functions, the normal cardiac um, parameters that are um, 
documented during echography, but also the more fancy uh, tissue Doppler imaging strain analysis. This is from the uh, first publication where uh, 50 children were compared to 50 controls. Basically, um, there were no major differences. Statistically, there was a difference in shortening fraction and ejection fraction, but this is clinically not relevant. In the update of the study, we had 25 ch 26 children uh, compared to 26 controls, including these more fancy techniques, and there was actually no differences in the two groups, also not in the ejection fraction. So, and this is important because these children were exposed to anthracyclines that are uh, notorious for their cardiotoxic effects. So in this group, um, also uh, there is no effect on the fetal heart. What about the ear uh, function? There are indeed not so many data on that. In the uh, 2012 publication, uh, we had data on 21 children, and there were three children with air, actually an impaired outcome. Um, one child had uh, hearing loss in the high tones, at the C, um, but at CT showed a damaged eardrum, so that's definitely an, an, a confounding factor. But the child was also exposed to cisplatin. Um, and there were two children with uh, hearing problems as well, but both children were born preterm, they had a major neurodevelopment delay, and they were exposed to idorubicin and arabinoside, who were actually not really known for their aut autotoxicity. There is one recent case report from the Netherlands um, where there was a serious um, bilateral perceptive hearing loss in a child that was exposed five times to 50 milligram per square meter cisplatin. So from, that, from these findings, in oncology, we prefer to give carboplatin rather than cisplatin during pregnancy. My main message is to my patients and to you is that if you put 10 children on a row and two of them have been exposed to chemotherapy, well, you will not see the difference and I won't see the difference. But most importantly, our researchers who examine these children in detail, they will not see the difference. And that's the clinical, the most important clinical message. Why is this? Well, because the placenta protects the fetus. The placenta is not a passive organ. There are receptors on the placenta that actually can capture the chemotherapy. For example, if you take a mouse who is deficient for this receptor, then you will see that all the taxanes will go through the placenta to the fetus, and the measurements in the maternal blood and in the fetal blood will be the same. Um, but with the, the uh, transporter, taxanes cannot be measured in the fetal uh, serum. We looked into this in, the, in a baboon model, model, and there we saw basically that in all tested drugs that are listed here, there was all, always lower levels of chemotherapy that were present in the fetus. But the actual percentage passage differs according to the drug. For example, the anthracyclines, 4 to 7.5%, uh, platin, 56%, so probably this explains the autotoxic effect of cisplatin, which is a sister compound of carboplatin. Paclitaxel and, and docetaxel are hardly uh, detectable. Cyclophosphamide, or the active drug of cyclophosphamide, 25%, and vinblastin, 18%. So that can, that together with the fact that we give chemotherapy after the first trimester of pregnancy, um, may explain why the results are so reassuring. The last section are some clinical recommendations. Um, the previous speaker already pointed to what the prenatal care uh, we published on this, and this is available. I think, indeed, what is important is the, um, to confirm the ev uh, evolutionary pregnancy and the exact date of the pregnancy, um, and to exclude any pre-existing fetal anomalies prior to any um, cancer treatment during pregnancy. And especially if there is any chemotherapy during pregnancy, the fetal monitoring, the growth, is very important. The mode of delivery is determ determined by the obstetrical indication and the timing of delivery. Our message is keep the baby as long as possible with the mother. Cancer is a multidisciplinary setting. Uh, this is an example for breast cancer. Different specialists are involved. Um, but this, of course, becomes more complicated when the fetus is there. Um, there we need really um, more psychological help, a pediatrician, perinatologist, perinatologist should be uh, involved. So this really takes time and a good structure, and that is mainly uh, provided in these uh, referral centers. 
Patients should be really discussed with the obstetricians in the tumor board, and this is rarely done, basically. And to give you an example, this is a patient with cervical cancer. And if you look into the literature, there are some examples of wound metastasis after cesarean section, probably because this is the low transfer incision. So we advocate here to use the corporeal incision to stay as far as possible from the tumor when you do a cesarean section. But that, this information you have to discuss during the tumor boards with the perinatologists. Also, this is the same patient. She had positive pelvic nodes. So we suggested during surgery to do a cancer staging. So here we removed the pelvic, uh, the parotid lymph nodes in order to tailor the radiotherapy afterwards. And that's so when the cesarean section was done, we completed the staging that tailored the further treatment. So again, this discussion between uh, oncologists and obstetricians is very crucial. I have pointed towards all the possibilities we have, um, but we have to be honest. Sometimes we are really in a situation where, um, despite all the knowledge we have and the technical capacities we have, we cannot help the patients. This is an unfortunate case of a patient with a high-grade sarcoma, which was covered, which covered the whole peritoneum, the uterus, um, so we tried, but actually the situation became impossible. So um, where it's impossible, we should accept this also despite the advances we have made. Especially in this uh, conference, um, and also underscoring the importance of what the previous uh, speaker said, um, in our cancer patients, we should not only discuss um, fertility, but we should also discuss contraception. In our data set, 3% of patients were actually not pregnant when they, the cancer was diagnosed, but they became pregnant during cancer diagnosis and during cancer treatment. So it's not because we know how to treat cancer during pregnancy that we should allow them to uh, conceive. So this is uh, important for the patients. Um, so I want to repeat my take home message. So I hope I could convince you that surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy are possible, that we should rather go for chemotherapy rather than induce prematurity and that this interdisciplinary approach in a referral center with a high risk obstetric unit is important in particular to um, detail or uh, delineate the further treatment and um, the identification of these small for gestational age babies. You're more than welcome to join us in the International Network on Cancer, Infertility and Pregnancy. We have now 112 members in 35 countries, and I have to thank the sponsors who pay our studies. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Amant, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, Dr. Woodruff, you have a question? Thank you so much for coming and delivering this good news to us. Uh, and I think there will be many members who want to join the registry. And my question has to do with the maternal outcome, because that also is related to the child uh, persistence and outcomes. Uh, do you have enough uh, um, uh, power in the uh, registry to know the outcome, the maternal outcome, whether they uh, went through treatment and delivery or opted for abortion, and can you actually um, look at treatment effects or cancer types in terms of that ability to persist for the mother? That's an excellent question, and I think the answer is largely negative, and largely we don't have these data. We only have the data for breast cancer, okay. um, where we looked into more than 300 patients and we compared them to 900 uh, non-pregnant patients, and there the prognosis was the same. But with one caveat, we don't know whether the uh, uh, chemotherapy, patients who receive the chemotherapy during pregnancy, of, if this chemotherapy is effect, as effective as in non-pregnant patients, because the, the chemo dilution during pregnancy, there's a definite chemo dilution, um, yeah. whether this affects the prognosis. Right. So therefore, the, even that um, study was not powered to answer that question. Basically, in oncology, we have to, to see that we have the, um, we need a quite, uh, a high number of patients to address this question because right. you've got different stages, different prognostic factors, and that means that you need several hundreds of patients in the study group uh, to answer this. For example, we are now working on 120 cervical cancer patients during pregnancy, but also that study will not answer that. We even need more of these patients. So I completely agree with that question. So this is some, well, something we have to, to discuss with well, the we patients. Can all join together, Definitely. Perhaps. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please. 
My name is Morishige from Japan. Uh, I'm a gynecologic oncologist. And uh, my question, I, I'm, uh, thank you for your uh, excellent presentation about INCIP registry. And after that report, I, we are very encouraged to uh, do the chemotherapy during pregnancy uh, in Japan, also in Japan. Yeah, okay. that's very impressed. And okay. uh, my question is, uh, in your or uh, registered institutions, uh, when is the targeted uh, delivery time? That means uh, um, gestational age uh, uh, to induce the delivery. When uh, that, that means uh, uh, in case of cancer-bearing mother. So in a, a patient who, a pregnant patient with cancer, yes. when is the optimal time of Optima, delivery? How do you decide to uh, de de deliver the baby? Uh, a little bit earlier or, uh, for example, uh, 20, uh, 35 weeks or, or 20 or 25 or, to, uh, no, no, 28 or in, 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 your, uh, in your situation or registered institutions? Um, it's difficult to, I mean, this it depends a bit on the individual situation. But I, what I can say is that when we started the study, there was a general uh, dogma that said if the fetus is viable, you can deliver the fetus, and then you can start the maternal cancer treatment. Yes. And I think we have now sufficient data to change this, to change this fetal viability to fetal maturity. Mm. We only deliver if the fetal is mature. Mm. And I think there we can use surgery or chemotherapy to prolong the pre pregnancy a bit. But of course, there are situations where this is not possible. We have to accept that basically the paradigm that we should do a cesarean section at 32 weeks to allow maternal cancer treatment, actually we should change this. A baby that is born at 32 weeks has a few percentages to die after delivery. Yes. We should really, and, and then the long-term consequences as well. So there we should really go to fetal maturity. That means, actually fetal maturity, that's 37 weeks. So, but if you go to 35, 36, 37, that would be uh, good. So around 27 or 28 weeks? No, we, we try to avoid that, to really try ah, to avoid ah. that. It's better than to keep chemotherapy or even to wait. You know, ah. I mean, ca cancer, the cancer prognosis will not change that much if you wait four weeks. This is in our mind. For the patient, that means like, I mean, you should treat really urgently, but that's not really the case. I mean, the cancer has been there for weeks, months, and sometimes years, and now suddenly it becomes urgent. So there we have to make the balance between the, feature, the fetal advantages and the disadvantages of preterm delivery. But our message is maybe waiting as such is not necessary. We can treat also. And by treating during pregnancy, we can overcome this gap. Okay. But it's always a decision that has to be taken on an individual basis. Okay, thank you. Is that more or less answering the question? Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, I think uh, in Japan, we all, we are, uh, that depends on the uh, institutions. So that means uh, NICU capacity, that depends on the NICU capacity. And uh, uh, in our institution, we usually deliver a, uh, a little bit earlier, uh, 32 weeks, gestation, gestational weeks. Uh, that's our uh, institution target. Okay, Thank congratulations. You. Yeah. And we'll take one last question from Mary Zielinski. Hi, we'll thank you for your beautiful presentation. I noticed that the upper um, age range of the children that you looked at was 18. So I'm wondering if you can pull out any information about uh, whether these children went through puberty normally, since we don't know effects on their uh, subsequent effects on the reproductive system, especially in ones that may have been exposed yeah. to cyclophosphamide. Well, we don't have these data in well-controlled setting, but we are looking into that. Uh, we are now looking into children who are six year old, and together we are looking uh, to children who are nine years, 12 years, 15, and from there on we will, we hope to draw these uh, conclusions. But as far as we see it now, it's not a problem. So we don't get information of these parents that these children are have a later puberty or not menstruating or whatever, they really develop as normal children as far as we have the children now. Thank you so much.